After graduating college, college, you sometimes feel the ambition for changing the world for the better, especially if you're a liberal arts graduate with no discernible skills. Political action, social restructuring, cookie recipes with no refined sugar. I moved to Chicago after college with a musician friend of mine. And some advice? If you've arrived in a big city with no career plans, time constraints, or the vaguest of deadlines, relying on a musician for stability is a bad idea. In that one hot summer, all my savings had disappeared and I was forced to find a job. My resume was very thin, but also weird. But the one thing it looked like I did know how to do was work as a baker which was unfortunate, because the one consistent thing about working as a baker is you start at 4 a.m. There used to be a bakery on Halstead Street called The Bread Shop. I don't know if anyone remembers it. Yay! It was a health food bakery, strictly vegetarian. I don't think vegans had even been invented yet. I went over to apply, and I was hired, like, on the spot. Back then, Halstead was a lot more scruffy and dismal than it is now. Not as on-brand, as my kids say. No rainbow pylons, just taxi garages and upholsterers and junk shops and general city debris. Down the street from the bakery was a very beatnik coffee house. The only coffee shop within four square miles for all you spoiled uh, caffeine addicts out there. It was called the Cafe Pergolisi. Let's announce our age to everyone. <laughs> Beat you to it. <laughs> French philosophers, dead plants, and all the burned coffee you could stomach. A sign on the wall read, if you're expecting quick service, you're in the wrong place. So, everything in the joint was so rickety. The tables wobbled, the bar shook. It was like having coffee under a Jenga tower. Because, because tightening screws on the furniture is so repressive, like... And hadn't the man been tightening the screws on us already? <laughs> to undergird my job plans, and also to scratch my itch to save the world, I had to do a little soul searching. Which group of saviors did I most identify with? With the beatniks, the punks, or the hippies? The beatniks were old and pretty humorless. The punks, like my roommate, were young and humorless, and really, really loud. The hippies, well, I'd hitchhiked twice in my life. Flowers and sunshine are pretty cool. Sugar magnolia, Yeah, sure, why not? Let's be a hippie this quarter. See how it works. The items in the bread shop looked, I don't know, well-intentioned. I'm a sucker for a little dusting of cornmeal on raw wood. The bread shop churned out hearty bread, more hearty bread, and concrete spheroids masquerading as bread. They, they also offered lumpy whole grain cookies that used, that used prune juice for sweetener. There was a huge concern back then for getting refined sugar out of your diet. Do you remember that? Remember when like, the biggest worry for life on the planet was refined sugar? Now I'd probably take that refined sugar and start a bee colony to stop ecological collapse. All right, bee next. come on. That wasn't a bad joke. <laughs> Fine. Thank you. She was bad, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. Like I said, starting time was four in the morning. Lakeview, was a, Lakeview as a whole was pretty run down back then. There wasn't a Wrigleyville or Lakeview East and West. There was just Lakeview, which was there to stop Uptown from spreading. <laughs> I lived on Sheffield on the same block as a porn theater and the Hotel Carlos, which then was a hot sheet hotel. Every night was a big city excitement. Cruising cars, gangbangers, cop cars, very extroverted women who thought my name was Stud. <laughs> Some mornings for fun, I used to walk down to Clark Street and look for bloodstains on the sidewalk. Once, some, once, someone kicked in the window of the Nisei Lounge and then left a trail of blood I followed for three blocks. I won't tell you what I found at the end, but I did learn that uh, 
I did learn one thing, that amateur sleuthing looks a lot more glamorous on television. The hard thing about a morning bakery job is not the getting up, it's the going to bed. It's like every night is when you were a kid and daylight savings time kicked in and your parents sent you to bed at 8 o'clock so you couldn't stay up and watch Laughing and see Goldie Hawn in a bikini dancing on television. And did I mention I live with a musician? If I ever saw him at all, it was when he was bringing home Carrie out and a bunch of musician friends and I had to go to bed at 9.30. The walk to the bread shop every morning through the deserted streets was like walking through an abandoned movie set. The red line L rumbled above, its cars were empty like the trolley in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, biding its time till normal people got up. Even the sun had better things to do than go to work. I shared the kitchen with Amber and Julian, who had pledged themselves to save the world through yeast and whole grains. <laughs> They were both earnest, no-nonsense, 10, 10 or 15 years older than me. Amber was in charge of the kitchen and had no time for chit-chat. The cookies I was to be baking, she sneered at with disdain. Indulgences for weaker people. <laughs> Julian, the bread baker, was a skinny guy with a gray blonde ponytail and a crestfallen expression. Like, how did we get here? <laughs> Reagan in the White House. Cyanide and the Tylenol. The Thompson twins. <laughs> They're not even twins, man. <laughs> this flower child was incredibly rigid in his thinking. Now, it was a small kitchen, but he demanded everything had to be done in a certain way, but dolefully, because otherwise it meant certain doom. <laughs> Soak your utensils before using them. Be sure to air dry them. Wipe off the cans before opening. Something filthy probably crawled over the top of him. He was always ready for the worst, with open arms and a sad shrug. And the cookies I was making. Oh dear God. The prune juice, oatmeal, and chopped date surprises. The slurry that could work for pothole repair, and probably does. Those lumps of healthiness looked like provisions Lewis and Clark might carry to fend off hostile bears or ballast their canoes. Well, maybe they were hit down at the Cafe Pergolese. Enjoy the taste of ennui, bourgeois dog. <laughs> <laughs> so this kept up for a while, getting up before dawn, following the orders of a passive-aggressive 60s casualty, hanging around home till 9 o'clock so I could go to bed and start it all over again. Then. My pal Sullivan comes to town, a world champion couch surfer. You know the type. Always broke, but always managing to con you into letting him stay in your apartment and also buy him beer. These things happen when you're 22. He was an old friend of both me and the musician, and he arrived in town with no plans and no place to sleep. So we three get some beer and some Chinese food for dinner. We start to tell stories. We drink some more beer. We start talking about new albums. We wonder who has weed at this time of night. We decide to find out. We drive around Bucktown and Randolph Street. We come home with weed and more beer and more Chai Gun Club. I look at the clock and realize I have to be at the bread shop in four hours. So it's decision time. In the grand scheme of things, four hours is not that long. It had been four hours, for example, since we had first started eating Chinese food. So the choice is, do I go to sleep now and get three and a half hours of sleep, or do I just stay up and go to work? I mean, how much is three and a half hours anyway? Not enough, so why bother? Why not just stay up till four, head over to work, come home at noon, which is now 11 hours away. How long is 11 hours? It's not even half a day. I've done that, probably. <laughs> and then I would come home, my pals would be there waiting for me. My pals, my closest friends, who needs another beer? Remember what it felt like to be immortal? <laughs> I make it to work at 4 a.m. Totally cool. No one suspects a thing. No one suspects my only agenda that morning is not burning the store down by accident. I get out a bowl. I start mixing prune juice with oatmeal. <laughs> Anyone says anything to me, I just nod. I add chopped dates to the oatmeal. Uh, 
then the owner of the shop comes in. She's dressed in a nice blue suit, carrying a big briefcase filled with binders. We good little workers are roused out of the kitchen so the owner can have a team meeting about how our work will save the planet one colon. So a lot of her focus was on me. Like, did I have a philosophy of baking? How long had I been devoted to natural foods? What allergies did I have to make my eyes so red and puffy? <laughs> now I'd like to tell you what my reaction was. That I had a long soliloquy with twisty, snarky logic like an early Bill Murray movie. Or I pulled an Atticus Finch on her. Or that I, I laughed, screamed, fainted, or threw up. But I don't remember what I did. By this point, I'd been up almost 30 hours straight, and I'd eaten a lot of Chinese food the night before. Also beer, and weed, weed and beer, mostly. My body felt like it was made out of bowling pins, and my brain was even less responsive. My flag was sinking fast. I had reached my limit, my hubris was dried up, and yet the world had not ceased functioning the way my nervous system had. <laughs> That day, I handed, my, I handed in my unbleached cotton apron and stumbled home to the apartment, where, of course, no one was waiting for me. I was still all gung-ho for saving the world, but the hours of this revolution really sucked. <laughs> Our eating habits could all use improvement, no doubt, but rolled oats, chopped dates, and prune juice is nobody's superfood. If you want to eat a cookie, Che Guevara, eat a fucking cookie. Thank you.